Um, first, just uh, probably some of you will see this as good news, I guess. Uh, unit four's test that we were planning on having Monday and Tuesday next week, we're going to delay that to Thursday and Friday. Um, this week was just starting to get a little too hectic in terms of as I was looking at the amount of work that I was going to have to make sure you got through and getting retakes, I think there's going to be a fair number of people taking retakes this time more than last time. So um, I don't want to overburden you too much with trying to get everything done this week and pushing through so fast. And we have a little wiggle room. So uh, I decided to go ahead and push that to the second half of next week instead of the first half. So uh, that means the assignment that I was giving today, I'm no longer giving. I'm just giving you basically the time to focus on test corrections and preparing for the retake for those that want to do that. Um, and so you'll have a little reprieve uh, tonight, basically, with no new assignment, just getting things caught up, hopefully. Um, and in a few minutes, I'll give you some suggestions on how to review for that test, even though it has been delayed. Uh, today, we're going to start in a few minutes with group presentations on Worksheet 2. I'm going to go through number one uh, for you and then have you guys present two through six as groups. And then at the end of the period, we'll talk about chapter three or unit three test corrections. Um, if you're doing test corrections, remember, you should do them on a separate sheet of paper. Uh, if it's a multiple choice question, you should put the correct answer and then some sort of a statement making sure you're kind of giving me evidence you understand the question now. You understand what the answer is and why. And then for an FRQ, just redoing the ones you missed. So if it has multiple parts, you don't have to do, like for the last question, it has A through D or whatever. If you only miss D, you don't have to redo A, B, and C. Um, and if it's a math question, like the first FRQ, um, if it's asked, if all you missed was a free uh, sig figs or unit or something like that, you don't have to redo the problem. Just put with correct sig figs and give me the answer or with correct unit and give me the answer. Um, so just correct what you missed. Um, if it's a, a, a more of an essay-ish style, like talking about why student one is right or wrong, those kinds of things, and just rewrite your answer that's with correct uh, statements if you lost points for those things. So um, what I try to do in my um, responses, I'm curious to see sometime what it looks like uh, from your side, but I try I'd like put A and then anything that I need to comment on if it's got multiple parts like that last question. And then I hit enter a couple times. So there's some space and then I put B and then some comments and then hit enter a couple times. So I try to leave some space. I'm curious if it actually shows. Uh, in the last test in the directions I asked if you would try to leave space between your answers and for none of them did it appear that it did. So maybe it just doesn't allow it. Like maybe when it saves it up onto the internet, it just eliminates all those white spaces. I don't know. Um, another thing I'm not crazy about access <laughs> with. Uh, but anyway, we'll be working on those test corrections at the end of the period. A couple of reminders though, the moving man lab number two, uh, you, we talked last week about corrections being due tonight. So if you haven't done corrections on your OneNote, make sure you're getting those done by tonight. I'll be checking those over Tuesday and Wednesday to change your lab grades if you did corrections. And then uh, the worksheet two that we're going to go over today in class, that's also due on access tonight. Uh, so Moving Man Lab just on one note, but uh, for the worksheet on access. And then test corrections and test retake deadline is this Friday. Since we are taking tests on unit four already next week, I want to make sure we get all the retakes and, and corrections done this week for unit three. So the times for retakes, it's listed on access on the bulletin board page in the announcement. Um, and if you haven't been getting notifications when I put up announcements, you may want to go to access and see if you can find where to set your notifications. I had some students tell me they did get a, a notification that I put an announcement up, but most haven't. So um, anyway, if you look at the announcements, you'll see you can do a retake Wednesday morning at 8, Thursday afternoon at 4, or Friday afternoon at 4. So Wednesday and Thursday and Friday this week are your three options. So uh, plan accordingly um, needs to pick one of those three times. It'll be similar in nature to the previous Unit 3 test, similar in question number similar in difficulty. I, I would say it may be slightly harder than the original just because trying to find good questions that are on the same kind of information. Um, I don't think it's significantly harder, but I, I think you might consider it slightly harder than the original, but it's the same content, just formatted different. Uh, so be preparing for that if you're planning to do a retake. Um, remember, you cannot earn the curved grade until you do the test corrections. So sometime in the next few days, I'll be putting the grades into Access instead of just in the comments where they're at right now. And if you've done the corrections at that point, I'll put in the curved grade. 
if you haven't done the corrections at that point, I'll be putting in the original. So uh, keep that in mind that you want to try to get those corrections done soon and, and for sure by the end of the week so you can get the curved grade. If you never do the corrections, you don't get the curved grade. And if you don't do the corrections beforehand, you can't take a retake. So you have to do the corrections before you can do a retake. So a few reminders there. Any questions about schedules, retakes, due dates, anything like that? All right. Well, let's jump into worksheet two. And I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, actually, first, no, let me talk to you about a few things you could do to prepare for unit four test. I'll just go through it briefly today. Um, I'll bring it up again when we meet Thursday and bring it up again next Monday as well. But these are just some things you could do. On Axis, uh, it tells you we sh we're covering chapter three. So hopefully you're reading through chapter three. But there's a bunch of questions listed there from the book that you could use for practice. And then on the bottom right hand corner of the Axis for unit four, uh, it's chapter three in the book, but it's unit four on Axis. So if you look in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see something that says review worked out uh, examples or it says worked out examples, but you could review those worked out examples. It's actually from another teacher where he or she, I don't remember, uh, goes through and explains projectile motion and works through some sample problems sort of step-by-step. Step. And then there's some practice problems in that same bottom right-hand corner. And it's just three problems, I think. There's not a real long review because we're only learning one topic. It's just projectile motion. Um, but I think there's three practice problems with the answers at the bottom of the page so you can check your work. Um, that's an option. And then uh, positive physics website, unit three is free fall, unit four is projectile motion. I'm not assigning any of the positive physics work for this unit, but those two units would be really helpful to practice. So I would recommend them. Plus there's videos on there you can watch um, to help learn how to do different kinds of problems. And then maybe the most important to me in terms of your overall development and college board level learning is using the AP classroom. We are finally wrapping up what College Board calls Unit 1. It took us four units to do it, but uh, they call Unit 1 everything about kinematics. And they've got a bunch of daily videos on there from a lot of different instructors. And everybody has different learning styles. And you may find that some of the instructors that are giving uh, explanations there, it makes maybe more sense to you than the way I'm explaining because everyone has different learning styles. And the way I explain it won't perfectly mesh with everybody. So I would encourage you to watch those videos all about kinematics and not just projectile motion, but everything we've learned since the beginning of the year. Um, there's also review questions for unit one that would be good for you to go through. There's both topic review questions and also progress report or progress check questions, all multiple choice, good practice for you. So I would highly recommend you get onto that AP classroom and use some time to practice with those videos and review questions. All right, so that is it for the test prep suggestions. Like I said, I'll remind you of some of those things later as well. All right, let's get to worksheet two. I'm gonna go through the first one for you. There's a couple things on there that I wanna highlight that I don't think a student would know to do yet since we haven't learned it. Or uh, one of them is not so much that we haven't learned it, but that it's a kind of a question I know College Board frequently asks, but so I want to give you kind of some help with that and preview it. So in the first question, it says, uh, given the following situation of a marble in motion on a rail with negligible drag and friction. And just a comment on that, um, we typically will be ignoring things like air resistance and sometimes friction. And it's not that we're saying they don't exist. We're saying that their impact is minimal or negligible. So um, we're not trying to deny them. We're just saying, they make a small impact, so we can ignore them in this case. So then A, sketch a motion map following the motion of the marble after it leaves the rail. So once it becomes a projectile. When it's on the rail, it's not a projectile yet, it's just in movement. And it would be with a constant velocity since there's no friction or air resistance. Uh, but once it leaves the rail, then it would be a projectile and gravity would be accelerating it to the ground. All right, uh, using the grid to help you carefully locate the marble's positions. Show both horizontal and vertical vectors on each dot. So at the first position, right when it leaves the table, it would only have horizontal velocity because it hasn't even had a chance to start to fall yet. So it has an initial vertical velocity of zero right when it leaves the table, but it will have a horizontal velocity that 10 meters per second that's given there in the diagram. And then I've tracked it five different times. I probably should have made my horizontal velocity vectors a little longer so it was easier to tell that they're the same length, but those horizontal ones are all the same length. 
And then I tried to track them in a parabolic path, uh, showing that while there's zero vertical velocity right when it leaves the table, just a short time later, there will be a vertical velocity. And then a short time after that, it will be greater vertical velocity. And then after that, greater vertical. And then after that, greater vertical. And so you're going to see the vertical velocity accelerating or increasing because of the gravitational force field of the Earth. So it's just looking for something similar to what I've drawn. You didn't have to really scale it. It doesn't say to make it quantitative, uh, just sketching it. So something like that would be great. Questions about the sketch? All right, part B is the one of the parts that uh, I think is possibly confusing. Sketch and label force diagrams for the marble when it's on the rail and off the rail. And I almost took it off. Uh, <laughs> In some years, I have taken it off. I think I left it on for you guys, though, the words force diagram, uh, because it's the next unit. And so I like to go over this one and start to introduce it as a preview, a little foreshadowing. Um, so I've got in circled over here on the left on and then on the right side off. So when it's on the rail and when it's off the rail. Um, so when it's on the rail, gravity is going to be pulling it down, but the table is going to be pushing it up. So the marble just stays level. It doesn't rise or fall. And so that'll make more sense next unit when we really start digging into forces. But hopefully that makes some sense now that gravity would be pulling it down, but it can't go anywhere because the table's in the way. So the table must be holding it up. Um, and then more importantly for this unit, though, the vertical velocity, because then it says describe horizontal and vertical motion. The vertical velocity, there is no vertical velocity. There is no vertical motion at that point. It's not rising or falling while it's still on the rail. But horizontally, that's what the capital H stands for. Horizontally, it's constant. Since there's no friction and no air resistance, the horizontal motion is a constant velocity. So I've abbreviated here so it would fit, but uh, vertically speaking, there is no motion. Horizontally speaking, it's constant velocity while it's on the rail. And then I just drew a divider line to show you, okay, that's the on the rail part. And now the right side, the off the rail part, um, it only has gravity in terms of any forces acting on it. We're ignoring air resistance, so just gravity is causing it to accelerate downward. And so vertically speaking, it is accelerating now. Its motion would be an accelerated motion vertically, but horizontally still it's constant because there's no air resistance or we're ignoring it. And it, there's no other force in the horizontal plane, so it would still have a constant horizontal motion. So any questions about part B? All right, for part C, once the ball leaves the table, calculate, calculate how long it will take for the ball to hit the floor. So I just used the second kinematics equation that we learned. And I, I thought about the vertical motion of the marble because horizontally, I know it's velocity, but I don't know how long it's gonna fly through the air and I don't know how far it's gonna fly through the air. So I really don't know very much horizontally yet. But vertically, I know it's gonna fall 1.5 meters and I just decided to make downward the positive direction so that I wouldn't have to deal with a bunch of negatives. And I know that the initial vertical velocity is gonna be zero, right? When it leaves the table, it hasn't had a chance to fall yet. So that original velocity is gonna cancel out the VOT since its original vertical velocity would be zero. And then uh, A is 9.8. So one half of 9.8 is 4.9. And like I said, I just made downward positive for this problem so that the 9.8 would be positive and the 1.5 would be positive. You may have made them both negative, which is fine. The negatives end up canceling. Uh, but I just took one half of the 9.8 to get the 4.9 there. And then I just solved for t squared. So I divided both sides by 4.9, took the square root, and found the time that it would be falling is 0.55 seconds. So it's going to be moving vertically for 0.55 seconds when it leaves the table till it hits the ground. Now, that's the one thing, time is the one thing that connects the vertical and the horizontal. So it's falling vertically for that time, but it's also flying horizontally for that same amount of time. So uh, that's what we're also gonna use for part D. But before we go on to part D, any questions about part C? So notice I'm showing you an equation, doing some substitution, I'm not really showing all the algebra, I'm just substituting some values in and then solving. All right, D, and the time you calculated for part C, how far will the ball travel horizontally before hitting the floor? Well, we know the time is gonna be the same, 0.55 seconds. 
And it gave it in the diagram above that its horizontal motion is 10 meters per second. So since there's no acceleration in the horizontal plane, we don't really need to use the kinematics equation, although we could. We could just put zero in for acceleration. Uh, but we can also just think of the straightforward distance equals rate times time, because there is no acceleration in the horizontal plane. And the rate is 10 meters per second. The time is 0.55 seconds. So horizontally speaking, it would travel 5.5 meters. So if we were to sum this scenario up, the marble will be falling for 0.55 seconds. It will fall a distance of 1.5 meters vertically, and it will travel a range of 5.5 meters horizontally in that time. So that would be a good description of this marble's motion once it leaves the table. So any questions about D? Now for E, it says, suppose the table was doubled in height to three meters, determine the horizontal range of the marble as it falls to the floor. What effect does doubling the height have on the range of the marble? What other factors affect the range of the marble? So over here to the side, I just put, well, height would affect it. The higher it is, the longer it takes to fall. The longer it takes, the farther it would travel in terms of its horizontal range. So height definitely impacts it. And then the initial horizontal velocity. Whatever that initial horizontal velocity is, the slower it goes, the less distance it will cover in its horizontal range. The faster it goes, the more distance it will cover in its horizontal range. So those would be the two primary um, impacts that would change the range of the marble. You could come up with maybe some other ways to manipulate the structure of the track and everything, but those would be just the simple things to think about what would affect the range. Now, in terms of the horizontal range, once we've doubled it to three meters, probably most of you did not solve it the way I did. Um, and in fact, if I were only focused on this worksheet, I wouldn't solve it the way I did. I would just go back to the same thing I did for part C. And instead of 1.5 meters, I would plug in three meters and find the time and then multiply it by the speed to get the distance, the range. I would have just redone basically part C and part D starting with a three meter drop. But I wanted to show you a different approach because um, a lot of times College Board will give you questions like this, but they won't tell you it's going 10 meters per second. They won't tell you the table is 1.5 meters tall. They'll say the marble is moving at a velocity of V and the table is X meters tall and they won't actually give you numbers. And so in a scenario where they don't give you numbers, I wanted to practice doing the whole variable deal. What if we solved this just thinking about variables if they didn't give us any numbers? So I took the second kinematics equation, just like we used here in part C, this delta x equals VOT plus one half AT squared. And the VOT is still gonna cancel out because vertically speaking, the initial velocity is gonna be zero before it has a chance to start falling. And I just solved it for t. So I multiplied both sides by two, so two delta x, and then I divided both sides by a, and then I took the square root. So from that kinematics equation, I know time would be the square root of two times the change in position divided by acceleration. I just rewrote the second kinematics equation solving for t and knowing that the initial vertical velocity is zero. And if I look at that, this is more of where the conceptual proportionality comes in. This two is a constant, just like it came from that one half, which is a constant. So I can ignore that two. And acceleration is a constant because it's due to gravity. So it's 9.8. So I can ignore that a and I could ignore that two. They're both constant values. I really only need to worry about the delta x. And they're saying if I'm going to double, maybe they don't say it doubles to three meters. They just say it doubles. Maybe they don't give you any numbers. Well, if it doubles, then that's going to impact the time by a factor of square root of two. It's going to make the time multiplied by square root of two longer if I double it. If I triple it, it would make the time different by a multiple of the square root of three. If I quadruple it, it would make the time longer by a multiple of square root of four. And you could, you could use any multiple in there. And I know the square root of two is approximately 1.4. So if I double the height, no matter where I started, if I double the height, it will make the time about 1.4 times longer, and it will make the range 
about 1.4 times farther. So this is a way you could solve the question and actually get a numerical answer, even though even if they didn't give you any numbers to start with. And it's a common kind of a question that they'll ask for you to figure out how many times faster will it be or how many times longer will the time be? And they don't give you any numbers. And sometimes it's confusing to figure out, well, if they don't give me any numbers, how do I know? Well, this is the way they want you to think it through. So I wanted to illustrate that once um, that you can solve this. And if you take 1.4 times 5.5, you get the actual range, which is, it's in the answers, 7.8 meters. All right, so just a different way to approach letter E. Any questions on the first problem? Anything on that first page you want to ask about before we move on? All right. I'm going to go ahead and break you into breakout groups then, and I'm just going to put you in random groups today. Um, five groups. So uh, since I did number one, group one will actually do question two. All right. And group two will do question three. Group three will do question four. So you're all going to do one question higher than your group number because I did number one already. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and when you come back, I want you to teach the class how you solved it. And I want you to use some sort of visual, not just holding your paper up to the camera so it's blurry and, and moving all over, but some other whiteboard, OneNote, some share, screen share, some format um, to explain how your either two or three students um, solve that problem. So any questions about what to do once you go into the groups? All right. Um, I am going to send you into these groups and just making sure they're evenly spread because it always puts, I have my other computer connected, so it always puts me in a group and I don't want to be in a group with only one other person to make them do it by themselves. So I got to make sure it's matched. All right. So uh, off you go. Group two do question, sorry, group one do question two, group two do question three, so on and so forth. And I'll be in and out to see if you have questions or need help. Good luck. All right, welcome back. I think everybody's back in the main room. Uh, let's have group one talk us through question two. I think I'm starting. So um, I was just doing the horizontal velocity calculations, which was the 30 centimeters divided by 0 0.2 seconds, which was 150 centimeters per second. And then I will spread that by the conversion for 100 centimeters per meter and got 1.5 meters per second as the horizontal velocity. And then uh, with that, you use one of the kinematics equations and it's the, um, it's the equation on the left and it's um, dy equals the vertical velocity times time plus one half of the gravity times uh, time squared. And from that, you figure out the time is uh, 0 0.43 seconds. All right. And there is something else that I did for on Desmos that also helps uh, with the problem for like calculating how far it goes. So this equation right here calculates the time using one of the kinematics equations. And x in this case, I wasn't able to get it for time, so I had to draw it as x, so sorry if it's a tad confusing. And um, it shows this line where the time when the ball hits the ground, because this uses the kinematics equation. So this is where the ball will like hit the ground exactly. And then this is using the velocity calculated through the photo gates, and then like multiplied by the time found in this previous one. And where they intersect is like the total distance, which is like 0. 0.643. So, that's another way to look at it. All right, good. Um, creative use of graphing to solve the solution of the two equations. Um, can I see the first screen back up there? Uh, the first slide share? Okay, so on, yeah, I just wanted to see, I didn't see the third step that was solved this way. So I just want to see if, if you used what, yeah, most students probably did this part here in the middle dx equals vxt, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Really small. Yeah. 
So you're just solving for that displacement with the rate times time. So yeah, okay, good, thank you. A couple different ways to solve that one. Uh, okay, let's go to group two, question three, very related to that one. Let me get my uh, picture up here really quick. Okay. One note is uh, <clears throat> taking a second here. There we go, okay. So for the first half of this, um, you're just trying to find the um, horizontal velocity, but it's a lot easier to do it. So you first need to find the time. Um, so we use this kinematics equation here. So you have the um, displacement, the change of x, which is 92. Um, and that actually should be negative, but it ends up being positive anyways. So uh, plug everything in uh, with gravity as the acceleration um, and solve through and time equals 4.33 seconds. Um, so then we uh, took that um, and put it into this other kinematics equation here. And through solving that, we originally had 5.77, but I think we forgot um, the over two part here. Um, so when you have multiply two on both sides of this equation, it's actually 11.55, I think. Um, but... Oh, I just realized we kind of did this wrong uh, because it's not 92. Uh, meters, it's uh, 92 centimeters. Uh, so uh, let me just screen share real quick. Can I screen share, Gavin? Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, I kind of screwed up our calculations. Um, so this is my really terrible visual aid, but um, so basically, uh, we found the same way, like they did time. So it actually ends up being a 0 0.433 seconds. Um, so then uh, if I just uh, do it again, then, oh no, my computer. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think it ends up being, so let me do it on my calculator real quick. Um, So it ends up being 0 0.57 uh, meters per second, I think. Um, and then, so if you plug that into the, and then so for B, how long it takes to go through the photo gates, that would be, uh, that would be, um, Sorry, we, <laughs> I kind of screwed this up. Yeah, I don't really know. I probably need more time for that, but I've kind of <laughs> already wasted a bunch of time. So <laughs> I'll just let it go on to the next group. That's all right. Yeah, once you got the time wrong, that made the rest uh, struggle. So let me, I think I have that one solved on mine. Let me uh, share real quick. Yeah. So um just one way to do it i used the 0. 0.43 seconds like they showed and like the other group got and i just used distance equals rate times time so the rate would be the 0. 0.58 meters per second that carter just showed um, and then using the same equation um, knowing that it's going to travel 0. 0.3 meters between the two photo gates and dividing it by the 0. 0.58 meters per second uh, it would take about half a second to get between the photo gates so I actually used um, this distance equals rate times time here and velocity equals distance over time. It's really the same relationship, just written a couple different ways. Here I was really just focused on thinking of it as horizontal distance equals horizontal velocity times time. 
uh, here it's really the same thing. I just use different variables to represent the same thing and solve for velocity. So, and then change it to solve for time. But um, yeah, that's a couple, couple ways to see that number three. Any questions on number three? Yeah, I had a question. Mm -hmm. So I also used, uh, like I converted everything to meters and I also get 0 0.43 seconds. But I was wondering what if you keep everything in the centimeters and then you get like a center, like 58 centimeters per second, would that still be correct? Because I know meters per second is like the standard unit. Yeah, I've had some, in, in, in number two, you have to convert something because uh, the 9.8 acceleration is meters per second squared. So you either have to convert the 9.8 into centimeters per second squared, or you have to convert the centimeters. But for number three, there's no acceleration. So you could leave everything in centimeters for number three if you wanted to. And as long as you show your work and have units, you could have it as 58 centimeters per second. Um, you'll still get the same time as long as all your units cancel. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else about number three? All right, group three, number four. Um, so this is our number four. So for the first part, which was where will the plane, uh, no, no, no. Do you want me to explain the motion map first? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So our motion map, um, first we have the range on the bottom and then we have the height and, um, the height the height that it will drop, it will be 300 meters. And the plane will be at the same point uh, as the bag when it hits the ground because they're going at the same horizontal um, velocity of 60 meters per second. And as uh, time goes on, um, the vertical velocity will continue to get uh, increasingly negative because of the acceleration of negative 9.81 meters per second squared. Uh, while the horizontal velocity will stay constant because there is no force enacting upon it. So for the first part, which is how far horizontally from the point released, the first part in order to find that is you have to um, take the negative 300 meters, uh, how far it's dropped, and plug that into the second kinematics equation with gravity as acceleration. So you get negative 300 equals one half negative 9.81 uh, t squared, and then you get, um, I didn't put negatives right here, but then you get negative 300 equals negative 4.905 t squared, and you get t squared equals 61.1621, and then time equals 7.82 seconds. So then once you have the time, um, you would multiply that by the uh, flying, or like the 60.0 meters per second. Uh, to find like the distance um, of x, like the delta x. So then uh, that would be 7.82 times 60, which is 469. And then once you do like the rounding for six bigs, you get 470 meters. All right, looks good. Any questions? All right, group four, number five. Okay, I'll share my screen right now. Oh, where's my one note? Okay. <sighs> Sorry, this too. Okay, see. You. Uh, so we look at this graph. Uh, where this child was going to throw a rock through this hole right now. So the, we know the initial velocity is about 3.0 meters uh, per second, and the total distance will be 4.5 meters. Since the horizontal velocity is constant, we can just find uh, how long does it take to travel 4.5 meters. So it, we calculate it. So we have 1.5. And then once we get 1.5, we can use that to find the vertical distance, which is what we're uh, 
which is what the question asks. By plugging it into the second kinematics equation, uh, we know that the initial velocity is zero, so we're left with uh, delta x equals uh, 4.9 times 1.5 squared, and the 1.5 is from the time that we found using the equation above, and then that will get you that the uh, delta x equals 11.025 meters, which would just get you 11 meters with sig figs. Um, and that's the distance from her hand to the ground. Looks good. Any questions on number five? All right, group five, number six. Here, let me just share my screen. Um, so, over here we drew the situation. Um, and so you have to find, for the first part, it says how far the horizontally, the initial dropping point, from the initial dropping point will the cherry pit hit the ground. So that's the red line. Um, and we used uh, one of the, the second kinematics equation to figure out the time. And then once we figured out the time, we plugged that into the equation for um, finding horizontal distance and the velocity of both the car, so the hand and the cherry was 18 meters per second. And so um, the distance traveled horizontally was 8.1 meters. And then for the second part of the question was if the car continues to travel at the same speed, where will the hand be in relation to the pit? And it was directly above because um, they're both traveling at the same speed for the same amount of time. So that's all we have. <laughs> all right. Any questions about number six? All right. Um, so that worksheet, make sure you're getting that submitted so that you can get credit for completing that on Axis. Um, that's due tonight. And uh, don't forget also getting your um, FET lab, Moving Man 2 lab corrections if you're needing to do that still by tonight so I can get those graded tomorrow and Wednesday.